Ayom Yom Chamishi B'Shavas. Today is Thursday. Today is Yud Odir. Today is Yud Odir. Huh? I'm sorry, Tess. Tess Odir. Now, Rabbi Sai, today is the day the Fidike became to America in, in, in 1940, in Tosh Shin. That means, what is it, 69 years ago, the Rebbe arrived in America, or as some would say, we're going into the 70th year since the Fidike Rebbe came to the United States of America. In the year that Rebbe arrived, it was a leap year, it was an Iber year, and he came in other Shani, the second other. In other words, he came Taka a week before Purim. And the first real Fabrengen that he had was the Purim Deke Fabrengen. The story of the Friedrich Ebbe's arrival, as I'm sure you all know, the story of the Friedrich Ebbe's arrival in Das Tachten, on the surface of it, has to do with the war. The Rebbe did not want to come to America. He had been in the United States a decade before. He spent a whole year here. And he wrote in correspondence that he decided that he doesn't want to settle in America. He wants to remain in Europe. And as I've shared with you the point that Rebbe said, I heard this from my book at Ola Shalom, whom I worked with. He was a senior Rosh Hashiva, and I was a young schnook. And he said that he heard then in Poland that the Fidik Rebbe said, I want to be a Rebbe over Hasidim. I don't want to be a Rebbe over the whole world. In other words, the Rebbe understood that coming to the United States means he's no longer a Rebbe over Hasidim, that the situation is going to force him to become a Rebbe Iber de Welt. And the Rebbe didn't want that. But the Ebishter did. And the Ebishter at Durchgefeit, the Ebishter accomplished what he wished, right? Like you have in Rashi and Chumash with Yankev Avinu. Yankev had to go into Golos. And if need be, he would go with shackles of iron, with chains. So the Ebishter made a whole Vestach, Me'emek Chevre, Eitzah Mukha Shalei Sei Tzadik, a whole long scheme, Amaisim at Yesef at Tzadik, and a disappearance in 22 years. So the Yankov Avinu should come to Mitzvah Bechovet. The Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, stayed in Europe almost as long as he could, uh, and he came here because of the war. That's the Das Tacht. Now, we know from documents and from letters that about a year or a year and a half before the war began, the Rebbe revisited the thought of moving to America. Okay, the Rebbe was here in 1929-1930. The Rebbe had left Russia, not really by choice. Also, it seems like he was pressured to leave. And uh, he settled in Riga, Latvia, which was the country that had given him um, uh, immigration, a right to immigrate. He, the Latvian government was instrumental in saving the Rebbe's life. Rebbe Mordechai Dubin, who was a Lubavitcher Chosid and a member of the political party of the SEM, of the, of the House of, of Representatives in Latvia, had negotiated the Rebbe's release from Russia, from prison and from Russia. And um, the Rebbe was living in Riga. And for the next six years, six years, the Rebbe's stationary reads, temporary home. Temporary residence. The Rebbe traveled a lot and was constantly evaluating possibilities. He went to Israel. One of the reasons he went to Israel was to contemplate the possibility of settling there permanently. He was in America for the same reason. He was all over Western and Eastern Europe for the same reasons. And the decision ultimately was to move to Poland, which was Eastern European, which was old-fashioned, which was poor, because uh, he wanted to be a chassidish Rebbe, a chabad chassidish Rebbe, and being a Chabad Hasidish Rebbe meant he had to have a Chabad Hasidish environment. And the closest he could have had, Russia was out of the question, the closest he could have had at that time was Poland. Um, as the war became closer, 1938, the war started September 1st, 1939. In 1938, the idea of moving to America was revisited. The Pratchett Fagan started writing letters. And papers were actually presented to the United States government about the possibility of the previous Rebbe emigrating to the United States. So when the war actually started and the Rebbe had to run and come here in a hurry, it was much easier for him to enter the United States because a lot of the groundwork had already been done. A lot of the pre uh, preliminary uh, paperwork had been done in anticipation of a peacetime emigration of the Rebbe to the United States. So when you look at it for face value, it almost seems like every event in the previous Rebbe's life 
was, so to speak, forced upon him. He left Labavitch because of a war. He left Rostov because they were going to put him in jail. He left Leningrad and Russia because the government basically gave him no choice. He had to leave. And so forth. It seemed that there's a series of coercive events forcing the Rebbe to immigrate from place to place, to go from one country to the next country to the next country. The Rebbe spoke about this, that Golos Lubavitch was exiled ten times. It's not exactly sure what the ten are, but from Lubavitch till New York was a Sara Golias, was ten exiles, ten Golias. But the previous Rebbe says in many Yasiche, the most notable, the most explicit, was said the day before he left Russia, which was the biggest move of his life, Simchas Teda. The previous Rebbe left Russia the day after Simchas Teda. Simchas Teda by Fabreng, hundreds and hundreds of Hasidim, possibly thousands of Hasidim, most of whom would never see the Rebbe again. This was their last goodbye. And it was an incredibly emotional weekend, uh, uh, Yom Tif Tishrei. Incredibly, incredibly emotional. And by that, Fabreng and the previous Rebbe made an announcement. And the announcement was, people think that my uh, immigrating from Russia has to do with extraneous forces, with pressure, with governments, with religious restrictions, with threats, with few options. So you should know that all of that is untrue. Quote, say the Mesudar Yesh Khan, there's a clear order, there's a plan, there's a master plan. The Rebbe spoke a Sikha, which they have on the, at the end of the video, um, America is Nishtan, they have this excerpt, these few minutes of the Rebbe speaking, where the Rebbe says, the previous Rebbe came to America and he makes an announcement. The announcement is that he came to the United States to prove as America is nicht anders. He came to the United States to establish that America is no different. Fidel Kemper says that you can make in America the same kind of Yiddishkeit like you had in the old country. He came to America to prove as America is nicht anders. So the Rebbe says, come on. He came to America precisely because America is your anders. He came here because America gave people rights, freedom of religion, and it was not oppressive and it was not abusive, and it certainly was not killing Jews. He came here because America is Andish. So what does it mean that Rebbe says that Kupt can America, while America is Nisht Andish, to prove America is Nisht Andish? And of course, the answer to that question is Bechlal on the lives of people. That's what the Rebbe says. And Allah has come of a common the life of a Rebbe, Nasi be Yisrael. There's Mehavayim et Sadegever Keinonu. The steps of man are preordained by God. The way I've heard it said, I don't know if this is true, but this is what I've heard, that what you do once you arrive is your choice. But where you go is predetermined. Because when you come to a place, you have good things to do, you have to do them. But the choice of where to go, the Rebishta makes. So whatever the explanations would be for how and why and what affected the Rebbe's departure from one place and his arrival in a new place, that's chitonius, that's klipa, that's the periphery. The Pnimiya Sadovit is, and this is how the previous Rebbe lived his life, he asked himself, what does the Abishta want from me? And um, um, he did not want to come to America. And you read in his talks, in his Sikhs, which are published, and I have to be honest, that most of those talks were not simply spoken, he actually wrote them himself. The Fidik Rebbe used to write his own Sikhs. He could speak for five minutes and write two hours worth of material. The Fidik Rebbe was the opposite of the Rebbe. The Rebbe used to spoke, speak at great length and write in tiny little sentences. He, he spoke very big kids. His, his articulation of thoughts was very concise. But when he wrote, it became a flower. This is different different personalities, different... So the previous Rebbe uh, used to write his own sikhs in many cases, not always, but all, many times. And he referred to his coming to the United States as the Hashgacho Hal Yoyno the mission from the divine hand. That's how he referred to it. And the connotation, the intent, in my understanding is, this is not my choice, this is God's. <laughs> and because the Abishta runs the world and runs my life, I must ask myself, what is God's message for me today? And when he came here, he, he made the adaptations, he made the changes that he felt the ones that needed to be made at the time and at the place to accommodate the continuation of Yiddishkeit in the United States of America. The holy words of the Rebbe, America is nicht anders. America is no different. This is the story. This is the story. The thing that's so powerful about the Fidi Rebbe's life, and really the only word to articulate it is Taka, it's powerful, is his incredible adaptability, his ability to change, 
He moved from one world to another world to another world. And in each world, he recreated himself. He reinvented himself. Bechol Mohusay, there's a Sikha from Friedrich and which is printed now in the Sikha in Tafshin Vav Tafshin Yud. And you know how it goes. The book comes out, I read it, and you never have to hear about it. But the Friedrich Kebbe says, I think it's 1947. But it's around that time. He says, Imagine a Jew who's 60 years old, broken in body and in spirit, has to start his life again like a child. So the Rebbe said about himself, a Yid Zachzik Yorahalt, a 60 year old man, has to re. Re, you know, uh, reset, restart, on him from the night, a brand new life, like as if he never lived. Might as well walk straight up. I saw you. <laughs> you didn't sneak in without being noticed. And he continued to recreate himself. In Russia, he was one kind of a Rebbe. Then in Russia itself, he changed. They're now finding the Maimorim from the Friedrich Rebbe from the very early years. When the Friedrich Rebbe became a Rebbe, he wants to be a good old Chabad Rebbe. Chesidus, Avoida, the Maimorim are incredible. They're finding now the essays that the Rebbe wrote in the early years, 1921, 1922, 23. Long, deep, involved, Haskol of Chabad, Chesidus. A few years later, the Friedrich Rebbe was busy with Yiddishkeit with Tashbar and with Mikvetar and with Shechita and so forth. Then he leaves Russia, he moves to Western Europe and he has to deal with one kind of Yiddishkeit. Then he moves to Eastern Europe, deals with a completely different kind of Yiddishkeit. And as the Rebbe used to say, in Poland the Rebbe suffered from jealousy. Had there not been a war, had there not been World War II, in a generation, all of Poland would have been Chabad Chassidim, at least the intelligent ones, the Kluge. And people were, were aware of that and they were not happy about that prospect. Then he comes to America, a whole new situation. You know, Rabbi Edelman Zagazunzain from Springfield, Massachusetts, I banged in Yeshiva a few years ago. She says one of the first things the Fidik Rebbe did when he came to this country, I'm just give you an idea. These are pieces of history that we don't even know anymore. He hired one of the best lawyers in the state of New York. And the Rebbe didn't have money to buy bread. One of the most expensive lawyers in the state of New York to fight against the New York State Board of Education to permit the two or three day schools that lived in New York City to teach Lamud Kedish in the morning. We're not talking about not teaching English. We're just talking about teaching mathematics at 9 o'clock. Let alone mathematics at 1 o'clock. And he got together the few. There was not a lot of day schools. Chaim Berlin, I think, had a day school. Tere Vedas had a day school. And Lubavitch, maybe there was one more. There was a school called Tere Semes in the 30s. I don't know how long that lasted. And they worked together to accomplish what? The children should not come to school and in a fresh mind learn geography and physics and chemistry and biology and history and social sciences and whatever else. They should learn it in the afternoon. It was a war because the New York State Board of Education said we have to educate our students to be good citizens. You want to learn religion? It's your business. But this is America. This is what the Rebbe was busy with. This is what the Rebbe was busy with. And he continuously reinvented himself. And the thing that I want to share, and this is a really, to some degree, a personal hergish. I'm not going to say it's entirely a personal hergish, because I think there's a lot of indications of this. I think there's a lot of proof for what I'm about to say. But nevertheless, I, this is a, a sense that I get. The previous Rebbe spent hours and hours and hours. Hours, we're talking about a Rebbe. Right? Which means like this. He was a very smart man. Friedrich Rebbe. <laughs> You talk about intelligent, you know, I, I, intelligent. I mean, these are these are not normal minds at all, you know, an infinite mind, you know. A cup was can't go into my I just made a cup, a totally different kind of a mind. But he was an extreme. He was a pnimi. He was a very deep human being at the same time, which means he wasn't just smart. He was incredibly connected, connected to himself connected to the Eibishter, and connected to the, his people and to his world. And the Rebbe did incredible amounts of thinking to ask himself the simple question, what does the Eibishter want from me? So we have the good fortune of following. The Rebbe didn't have the good fortune of following. He had to create. Right? If this can be said, and maybe it shouldn't be said, our Rebbe, the Rebbe's all good. Follow the lead of the Friedrich Rebbe. The Friedrich Rebbe set an agenda. 
the Rebbe created it. The Rebbe just Meshachshe given, Perech given, Yotzei to Porach. The the successor of Lubavitch is the Rebbe. It's not the Friedrich Rebbe. But the tone, the the direction, the priority, the previous Rebbe set. I'm just tell you two little episodes which are well known, which give you illustrations of this. They're saying Kaddish for a Jew named Rabbi Groner, who passed away in Melbourne, Australia last year in Dal Thomas. And the Stachmamish Chaval al the Abdin Velomish Takhin. You know, we're losing. Lubavitch lost Hillel Pezna a year ago. The best. And we can't replace them. <laughs> Itcha Groners don't grow on trees. These were the Rebbe Shluchim. They, they were big people. They were very, very special, special Jews. Tamid Chachomim, Chasidim, Yerei Kim, and full of Mercedes Nefesh. These people are passing away. You know, one passes away, another passes away. We don't realize what we're losing. You can't replace these. These are the Rebbe's, these are the Rebbe's giants. And they did incredible things over the course of their successful lives with the help of the Ebishter and the Brachas of the Rebbe. Yitzchak Grona was sitting in 770. Yitzchak Grona had an incredible mind. And he was a masmid. He sat and learned. And he was matzliach and learning. And he was one of the Bachrim who would shmuz with the Ramash. He would talk to the Rebbe and learning. And of course, talking to the Rebbe and learning is a lot of fun because it's never hard. It's always easy because it's always on his fingertips. And evidently, the Rebbe, the Rebbe liked him. And then the Friedrich Rebbe sent Rabbi Gron, he was a bacher still, on a shlichus to some place to make a yeshira. Buffalo, Philadelphia, I don't know where. So the Rebbe, I'm sorry? That was his first shlichus. There were many shlichus. Yeah, Providence, okay. No, by Providence, you're here. So you're saying Providence, Miss Tam is Providence. And if it's not Providence, that's also Providence. <laughs> and the Rebbe went into the Friedrich Rebbe and said to the Friedrich Rebbe, we have one young man that can actually become a chassidish rosh yeshiva. A true Talmud Chochem, at the same time a chassid. Shouldn't he be allowed to uh, condition himself for that role? Shouldn't he be left alone? I mean, you know, not everybody can be, you know, there are certain exceptions to rules. The Friedrich Rebbe took kids, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, made them Rosh Yeshivas. The Rebbe proposed to the Friedrich Rebbe that Groner should be left alone. He said, can I just not learn it? And the Friedrich Rebbe said, no. This is the job that has to be done now, and no one is exempt. So this is where the Rebbe got his counsel from. This is the Maise Shahoya. This happened with the, the, the Rebbe went into the Friedrich Rebbe suggesting that maybe Efsha Nish, the Friedrich Rebbe said, nein, yo. And then, of course, there's the other story which they had in the Living Torah not long ago, where... The rabbi said this over to, to people. He came downstairs from the Friedrich Rebbe and he asked the Friedrich Rebbe, he came downstairs from the Friedrich Rebbe, he saw two Bachrim. He said, ich komm jetzt von Schwer, I'm coming now from Friedrich Rebbe, and I have to tell you what I just heard, what just happened. The Rebbe loved to, <laughs> the Rebbe was not into keeping secrets. You know, that's for other people. I call them the professional shushkas. The Rebbe had a, a pearl, a diamond, he immediately shared it. You know why? Because when he shared that pearl, he didn't get any poorer. <laughs> he got only richer. So the Rebbe sees these two bach with kum jetzt von Schwer, I'm coming out from Friedrich Rebbe. And he says, I ask the Friedrich Rebbe the following. He says, I sit in the Merkis. The Rebbe sat in the Merkis. All kinds of people come in. Amongst them, you have Yidin, who are Machalale Shabbos. They're not religious. They don't keep Shabbos. They don't keep kosher. And there's an element of them who are not Tineke Shanishbu, who are not not from out of ignorance. They're not from out of choice. And a pidin, according to Jewish law, somebody who's not from out of choice, you're not supposed to be very nice to. Taylor doesn't say nice things about the Shonda Upidesh, the person who raised in a chsidish home and a from home and went away, and especially if he's going away is with the boys, with the disrespect and with the cynicism. You're not supposed to be makad of such a person. The Shonda has very strong words about such people. So the Rebbe goes into the Friedrich Rebbe and says, the office is open, people walk in, and I'm nice to everybody. Maybe I shouldn't be so nice to everybody. This is what the Rebbe asked his Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe. So the Friedrich Rebbe gave him a marshal. And he told him like this. He said, the teva, the, the nature of parents is that there's always enough love for all of their children. There's no such thing as a parent who doesn't have enough love. You have one child, you love that child infinitely. I just can't find my phone. You have two children, 
So you love each child. If you have ten children, you love all of the ten children differently. There's no such thing as a parent with not enough love. That's what they have Okay, maybe the, the hippies in America think otherwise because we're so busy loving ourselves. But as they have a the Rebbe is gerecht. You have ten kids, it's not the pshat, you have to divide the love ten ways, there's enough love for everybody. He says, and what happens if a parent has a child that's what they call today a special child? Nishkin Gesundheit, he's unhealthy, he can't walk, he's missing a hand, he cannot see. That child gets from his parents a special love. So the Rebbe says, the Eibishta has enough love for all of his children. What about those children who cannot walk? That means to say, they don't go to shul. Or they're missing a hand, translate the Rebbe, they don't put on the film. And he went through a series of examples. Or they don't, they, they cannot speak, doesn't learn Tere. He says, Farazamin kin to have hav melt and special liebschaft. A, a, a dependent child, a compromised child, is a special love. So the Rebbe says, the Friedrich Kebbe tells the Rebbe that this is how you have to treat people that the Shulchan Naruch says, Miriudim Velemailen. So the Rebbe, to a great degree, I mean, no one, to say that the Rebbe did not invent something is ridiculous. The Rebbe took Bashaf on Lubavitch. But the Friedrich Rebbe set the tone. Who set the Friedrich Rebbe's tone? He did. The Friedrich Rebbe was a Rebbe. But he was also the son of a Rebbe and the Chassid of a Rebbe. And he was given a shlichus by his Rebbe. The Rebbe Rashab wrote a will which is printed in part, in which he instructs the Friedrich Rebbe as to what he wants him to do. Well, guess what? He didn't do it. Because he couldn't. Because the Abishta had other plans. The, 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 the Tzavo that the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe said explicitly, the purpose which I was created for, I've not been able to do. Why? Because you have to save Jewish children from Shmad. So this is the, the thing about the Friedrich Rebbe that's so, like I said to you before, it's such a powerful thing to contemplate. This, the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, he created, he didn't create Chabad over again. He, the Chabad is the Ebishtas. But he recreated his purpose. And in, in a little bit, this is my imagination, and a little bit you could read it in the Sikhs and the Mechtavim. The Rebbe spent so much time thinking, 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 thinking. People used to ask the Friedrich Rebbe questions. And he would say, I'm still thinking about it. And I'm still thinking about it, it could be for five, six years. And when the Friedrich Rebbe says, I'm still thinking about it, and six years later he gives you an answer, it's not the pshat, he put it down on a piece of paper and he forgot it, and six years later he found the piece of paper, he thought about it for five minutes, made a decision, he thought about it for six years. The Friedrich Rebbe spent years deciding where he wanted to live. Years. Until they decided to settle in Poland. And a, a few years later, the Abish just schlepped him out of Poland, brought him to America. This is the, this is the story of the Friedrich Rebbe's life. And the the the, the pnimius of it, in other words, the part of the story that's negir to us, uh, as it's explained in the the base rabbi nasher babavel sicha, the sicha that the rebbe gave out in tafshin and beis, is that when the previous rebbe said in 1927, say the mesudah yeshkan, there's a 1928, 1920 new, 1927, say the mesudah there's a master plan, and when his father said a decade before. In 1915, as he sat in the wagon, leaving the city of Lubavitch, and the official plan was, the official plan was, that it's a temporary leave. The, Friedrich, the Rebbe Rashab left Lubavitch because of the war. The Rebbe Rashab hated the Germans, he hated Wilhelm, just like the Alt Rebbe hated Napoleon. He saw him as the embodiment of Klippe itself. There's a lot of stories about that. And when the Germans advanced eastward into Russia, the Rebbe left because he didn't want to be under the German occupation. Although the Germans were pretty good to the Jews, as long as they didn't live in border cities, the yeshiva stayed behind. The Bacham continued learning for two more years in Temchat Mimim. But the Rebbe did not want to be under the German occupation. The plan was that he's going to come back. That was the plan. Yet he got into the wagon and he sits down and he says, Hundit and say, Yoraz Labavich given the ira bira from Chesidus. For 102 years, Lubavitch was the capital of Chassidus. And now it's going into Golis. In other words, he understood plans, shmans. This is a one-way trip. He's not coming back to Lubavitch. And his not coming back to Lubavitch was not, in his mind, a technical thing. It was not, in his mind, something to do with circumstance, but something that had to do with destiny.
with the Ratz and the Elyon, with what the Eibishter wants, right? 1915, 1915 is how many years ago? 94 years ago, right? That's almost 100 years. And um, during this time, the world has changed incredibly. And the face of the Jewish world has changed even more. It's not, what's happened to Jews in the last hundred years or whatever it is, is it's unbelievable. Not just Svardim, not just Ashkenazim, but in the second half of this century, Svardim as well. Svardim have been uprooted. I saw a number of 550,000. I, 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 Social scientist, I think there's a lot more than 550,000 Svadim that lived in Arab countries that have been uprooted by the establishment of the State of Israel. That sounds like a low number. But the incredible numbers. Hundreds of thousands of Jews of Svarad who lived in their native lands for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years had to move because the modern State of Israel created new hatred. So there's been an incredible shift. And hidden underneath all of this upheaval and all of this turmoil and all of this chaos and all of this lack of continuity is Mashiach Tzadkein. That's how the Rebbeim see it. That's how the Rebbeim understand uh, what's going on. And if you had to put it into a, a form that the Nefesh Abahamis could agree with, it's what the Gemara says. Everybody knows this Gemara. The Gemara says that before Mashiach comes, there's a process of tshuva. This is us. We are the time of tshuva. Now, does tshuva mean you have to first become not religious to do tshuva? I think Baruch Hashem in today's day and age, you can be 100% from, and somehow you have a lot to do tshuva for. We are a tshuva generation, a returning generation to the Ebesh. And the Rambam brings down the, the famous Rambam that Rabbi used to say with so much emotion. As if teira, as Yisrael b'seif galus on eisin tshuva umayad hein The teira gave a promise and a guarantee that the Yidna are going to do tshuva, um, yad and they will be redeemed immediately. Mashiach will come right away. This is, this is the world we live in. This is the time, this is the confusion, this is the upheaval, this is the lack of clarity. That is our world. And um, somehow it's our responsibility to do something personally and in terms of our ability to influence other people, in terms of, of, of bringing the world to tshuva, bringing the world towards Mashiach Tzadkenu. And as I mentioned to you on many previous occasions, in 1967, there was the war in Israel, the Six-Day War. The following Tishrei, which was still 1967, um, the Rebbe spoke to my modem, to my modem, with the same day about Hamaschal. That when Mashiach comes, you're not going to do tshuva. They're going to come from Ashur, and they're going to come from Mitzrayim, they're going to come from Assyria, and they're going to come from Egypt. And the Maimori Hasidus explain that Ashur means Golos of Ashirus, Assyria means a Golos of wealth, and Mitzrayim means a Golos of poverty. Egypt means a Golos of poverty. All kinds of Jews with all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of uh, explanations and bases come back and do tshuva. And after the Six Day War, the Rebbe started a tshuva campaign. He, he almost, uh, maybe not almost, he announced that it's the Hebt Khan at Kufa. This is now is the time for Chuva. This is 1967. It's a time for Chuva. And like everything else that the Rebbe did, he didn't just tell other people to do it, he did it himself. And the way it expressed itself in the Rebbe, Kamuvan began Pasha, the Ikir was Yechidis and Shlichis. The Rebbe spent thousands and thousands and thousands of hours personally, bring people back to do tshuva and to come closer to the Yebishem. And this we all know. But in addition to that, one of the things that the Rebbe did after the Six-Day War was he started a series of discussions on the Alta Rebbe's Yerusha Tshuva. For the next three years and some, every Fabrengen, the Rebbe spoke on the Yerusha Tshuva. In other words, just like the Rebbe spoke always on Rashi, the Rebbe spoke on the Yerusha Tshuva. And Bedas Tachten, the explanation for why he did this, is because he announced that now is a Tkufa of Tshuva. This is a time for Tshuva. So this is, this, is the, this is the story. The, the, the underlying point is and the, the way to repair itself from Mashiach is to do a little bit better tshuva. Let me tell you a story. And the reason I'm telling you the story is because I really did not plan to spend 45 minutes or 40 minutes on this topic. I wanted to learn Maimit. But the Maimit is going to have to wait. But let me tell you this story. This story is the first from the Fidik Rebbe Sichas that's printed 
1920, the Rebbe Rashab passed away. The Fidik Rebbe becomes a Rebbe. But the Rebbe Rashab passed away based on Nisan, the, tw- the second day of Nisan. And Grada de Histalka said the Rebbe Nishma Satan has a very, very strong connection to Purim. The whole Arich is the famous Maisu with Purim, and it's just going, it's, 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 The story of the Rebbe Rashab's passing is an incredible story. It's a haunting story. It's a hallowed story. Um, but that Tishrei, six months before the Rebbe Rashab passed away, there was a Fabrengen of the Friyadik Rebbe with the Bakhrim. Tmimim. At that time, the previous Rebbe was not the Rebbe. He was the Rebbe Zun. He was the son of the Rebbe. Naturally, everybody treated him with great respect. But the relationship was quite different. He was not the Rebbe. He was the son of the Rebbe. Leizen Nanes, I told this to you many times. Leizen Nanes writes in his biography that, his autobiography, he writes that he went into the Rebbe in 1966. And he said to the Rebbe, I want to relocate to America. Now in 1966, Leza Nanis was about 70. Now 70 is old. He spent 20 years in the gulags. 70 was ancient for him. And how was he supposed to know he's going to live till 100? I mean, he didn't have the, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't come with a ticket that says 30 more years. He figures two, three, four years, his machine's going to break down, finished. Can kinder lie that they came on the gahat? He never he was separated from his wife for twenty years. He had no children. <laughs> when you're in jail, you can't have children. And um, so he wanted to be by the Rebbe. So he comes to the Rebbe, and he tells the Rebbe he wants to relocate to New York. Now the Rebbe had told him, I don't know if before or after, that the twenty years he spent in jail don't count. That's why he lived till ninety nine. Lived until the hundredth year. Take off twenty. He lived only eighty. You understand? <laughs> Not actually. The twenty years he spent in the gulags and the labor camps that ever told him they don't count they're not part of his biological cheshbon so, so but he is now around let's say 68 69 70 he he doesn't think he's got a long time to go where's the better place to die than in the Rebbe's al damas he didn't come here to die he came to Oislev in the Yarden to live and of course the Rebbe knows <laughs> the story the Rebbe wanted him in Israel and the Rebbe wanted him involved in the variety of moistus the Rebbe appreciated Leiza Nanis as soon as he arrived. And they gave him responsibilities. And they wanted him involved in the Moistus. They was trusted him, even though he was a recent arrival, and the Moistus had been, some of the Moistus were 20 years old. They wanted him involved in everything. They when, they made, when, Leza, when he died, when he passed away, Zebdelik Slodom of Shalom, who ran the Kerl Chabad by himself, they made a committee to run Kerl Chabad, and one of the members of that committee was this same Leiza Nanis. So he says, I went into the Rebbe, Zeb Lezanana says, and he told the Rebbe, I want to relocate to the United States. So the Rebbe told me he wants me to live in Eretz Yisrael, because he wants me to do kach for kach. So he said to the Rebbe, I said, 20 years in the Gulag, I'm an old and defeated, broken man, I want to be near the Rebbe. So the Rebbe answered me, he says, a soldat gate from a shiktim. A soldier goes where he is sent. Not where it's convenient for him. But Lazananus adds a few words which are a window into our Rabbeim. He says, I never heard a Rebbe talk with such force since I heard the Rayats Fabreng Bechayef and Rashab. Those are his words. I never heard such power from a Rebbe, such force from a Rebbe, since I heard the previous Rebbe Fabreng before he became Rebbe. B'chayi from Tatan. You get the picture. When the Rebbe Rashab when it was alive, was B'chayi from Tatan, if Fidi was not the Rebbe, he, he could afford to lay it on. The Fidi Kebbe's Fabrengians were fire. The Fidi Kebbe, he was pushed, it was, it was the, the expression they used, it was so hard to listen to him because the demands and the bittle was, you felt like a, like a, like a, like a shmata by his Fabrengians because he spoke about himself like a shmata. They, they were so strong. They were so demanding. They were so urgent. The, the idea that Mesiris Nefesh is our bread and butter was in every word. When the Fidi Kebbe became a Rebbe, there was a mask. And the Hanasi Bistral, words, a Rebbe, once he's able to see us, some words can't come out of his mouth because whatever he says happens. It's the same person. It's a different chair. It's a different position. So when the Fidi Kebbe became a Rebbe, he was muffled. 
So Leith and Nana said, the Rebbe spoke to me and that, Yechidus, I hadn't heard a Rebbe talk like that since I heard the Fidik Rebbe talk before he was a Rebbe. So this is the Fabrengens. The Rebbe used to make Fabrengens, the Fidik Rebbe, and he would invite only Elter Abachrim. It was very exclusive. And of course, somebody would find out and everybody would sneak in through the windows. There's nothing new in Lubavitch. And he told them the following episode. The following episode. I'll tell you a story as Hagdama to the story. That the Rebbe Rashab and the Friedrich were in Germany. Würzburg, perhaps. In 1906. 1905, 1906. And in, that, in Würzburg at that time, or whatever city it was, it just was not Berlin. I don't know what it was. There was an exclusive park. It was a privately owned park that was accessible only to members of the royal family and maybe the nobility. And you had to have special passes to get in. And it obviously was gorgeous. And many of the members of the royal family and the nobility had cottages, private cottages, private little estates within this park. The previous Rebbe and the Rebbe Rashab were there. And they were standing by the gates of this park. And the Rebbe Rashab says to Friedrich and Rebbe, I really would love access to this park, right? So for a hefty bribe, the guard allowed them in and in fact gave them a tour and accompanied them. And they went, they walked around the park and he showed them the different attractions and he showed them the different cottages and he told them who owns what. And they came to a particular cottage and this is the Kaiser's cottage. So the Rebbe Rashab says to him, I really want to go in. So for another bribe, he opened up the door and let him in. The Rebbe Rashab walked into Kaiser Wilhelm's study. He sat down on Wilhelm's seat. He took Wilhelm's quill and ink and stationery and he wrote on my Mercedes. But before he started writing, he sat down and he said, a klugenstuhl, a wise chair, a smart chair. Wilhelm wasn't stupid, he was just evil. There's a difference. A smart chair. I think there was another expression. A klugenstuhl. Maybe there was another oishbrach. But a very interesting oishbrach. The Rebbe Rashab saw Wilhelm as a powerful force. Then he wrote the Maimir and he took it with him. This Maimir, the Rebbe Rashab kept in a portfolio. He had one of those, you know, those leather bound, leather things with a zipper. The Friedrich Rebbe never saw that Maimir. A very short while before the Rebbe Rashab passes away, he opens up the portfolio, pulls out the page, and has Wilhelm stationery on it. And he says to Friedrich Rebbe, Gedenkst, remember? And the Rebbe says, yes. And the Rebbe Rashab strikes a match and burns it. And the Rebbe Rayat says, I, I, went, I, I said, Tata, I said, what are you, you know, I, I was like, my first reaction was, how could you do it? And then I realized, my father could do whatever he wants, you know. I, so the, the Friedrich Rebbe describes this to the Rebbe in the Deshimist. I, I, I said, Tate! And then I realized to whom I'm talking. In other words, very beneath the Zogdem Rebbe. The Fidik Rebbe never read that piece of paper. He doesn't know what's on it. But now the second story. And the second story is in the Sikh of Tafresh Pei. That Wilhelm was destined to speak, was scheduled to speak at, a, at, a, at, a, at an event where thousands of Germans were gathered. And the Rebbe Rashab says, Kum Fidik, Kum Lomir again, let's go. They went from their hotel to this outdoor place. And they stood at the back, thousands and thousands of Germans and two Eastern Europeans. I mean, they, 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 they were obviously Jews, but East and West Europe was not only separated by Jews and non-Jews. It was a whole different culture, a whole different dress. Wilhelm was on the stage, and in a matter of seconds or minutes, he spotted them in this massive crowd. Wilhelm, and he turns to one of his advisors and he says something, and they both laugh. Within five minutes, they were asked to leave before the Kaiser would speak. Wilhelm wanted them to go away before he spoke. And when the Rebbe walked away, he said to his son, He's already made plans for a complete war. This is, nine, this is almost 10 years before the war, eight years before World War I. And the Rebbe saw him, he saw Mamish as another Napoleon. And he was another Napoleon. And the effect that he had on the world was Napoleonic. He changed the world. He secularized the world. That fafreit develop. It's a daf and tonchuva bringing Mashiach.